So growing up, I stayed at my mom's house during the week because she lived near my school. But I would spend the weekend at my dad's because he liked to drive me to all my sporting events. It never really bothered me because they both had a room for me and snacks that I liked. I felt equally comfortable in both houses, except for this one winter where my dad was having his kitchen redone. So he rented one of those Airbnb extended stays where you stay at an Airbnb for like two months. It's not like this house was gross or anything. It was just super bland. It was located right next to an old church, and apparently it used to house all the nuns and the sisters that worked there. And I don't mean this in a bad way, but that's exactly how the interior looked. Like it housed nuns and sisters. The entire place had beige carpets, even the kitchens and the bathrooms. All the walls were like dark, shiny wood panels, and you could see in each room where the cross used to hang because there was almost like a faded indent. And the dark wood panels had these black streaks in them that almost made patterns of ghoulish faces in some spots. You know like the scream mask where it just has two eyes and a long, narrow mouth? The weirdest part about the house was the layout. It had one big living room at one end, and then a long hallway that connected to the kitchen kitchen and the dining area on the other end. The long hallway had all the doors connected to the bathrooms and the bedrooms, but then the bedrooms also had doorways connecting to each other. Every single room had multiple entrances and exits, and every single room connected to each other. It was like a big circle. You could get through any room through any door. It was like there was zero privacy. It was absolutely bizarre. But anyway, I would spend my weekends there, and the first few weeks, I would just get stress dreams at night and wake up multiple times, until one dream kind of stuck. In this dream, I was laying in the living room, and I was just staring down the long hallway. The first few times that I had it, there was nothing there. The door was just open and the hallway was empty. But I had this eerie feeling that there was something at the end of the hallway. This dream happened so regularly that I actually started to get comfortable with it. I would be almost lucid dreaming just thinking, here we are in this dream again. It got to the point where I was just in there chilling. And I guess whatever was at the other end of that hallway didn't like how freaking chill I was. And it decided to reach its hand into the hallway. Like it was waiting for me around the corner to get comfortable. It didn't grab the edge of the wall or peek out. It just reached its fully open hand into my line of sight at the end of the hallway. The hand was big. I woke up from that dream super uneasy. It really bothered me all week, even back at my mom's house. But I never got nightmares at my mom, so I wasn't scared to sleep. When the next weekend came around, I was far enough removed from it, so I didn't really care. It was just a dream. In my head, I was just gonna watch a comedy before bed and get through the next couple weeks. Until the kitchen's done and my dad gets to move back to his normal spot. But like clockwork, I fall asleep and the dream starts again. I'm stuck on that couch again and there's the hand sticking out into the hallway. I'm freaking out because the dream started where it left off. This time, whatever was around that corner took an impossibly long step into the hallway. I say impossibly long because I couldn't see his body still. Just two limbs. And the worst part about this dream was that it felt like five minutes every time it happened. A regular five minutes. Then I'd wake up and my alarm would be going off. There would be no other dreams. It didn't feel like I was getting a full night rest. It's like I would doze off and I would enter this odd five minutes of this thing at the end of the hallway just inching closer towards me. Then it was just time to start the next day. Exhausted and scared. Thankfully, I would only sleep there about two nights a week so I would get full nights of sleep the rest of the week. But I really started dreading going over there on the weekends. This cycle went on for weeks. This entity at the end of the hallway showed all of its limbs to me first. But one night, it just yanked them all back out of view for a moment before crouching down onto all fours and scooting itself into the middle of the hallway. Like when a dog is trying to be sneaky. Then it just stops once it's facing me. I still couldn't make out its whole body because it was so condensed. But that dream abruptly ended with it popping up onto its fingers and toes and just slightly tilting its head at me. It's like it popped up into a ready prone position. And each night after that, it would take one step towards me, almost moving like a crocodile. When its right hand would move, its left leg would move, and its torso would swivel. It would wait the full 4 minutes and 59 seconds just staring at me, tilting its head side to side, before it just took one step right before I woke up. It started bothering me so much because it was so consistent. I would catch myself midweek thinking, it's past the second bedroom, or it just passed the bathroom, it's halfway down the hallway, just in the middle of class during the middle of my week. If two more weeks pass, this thing's going to be in the middle of the room. So finally, I pretend to be sick one weekend so I don't have to go over there. Because in my head, if I take a two-week gap, it might be long enough to break the consistency of this dream. And it kind of worked. The first night back, I was still in the dream, but the hallway was empty. In my mind, the dream restarted, and I could live with that. Because we only have two weeks left here before the renovation is done and we get to go back to my dad's regular house. I'm looking down the hallway and I'm waiting for the hand to stick out. I'm anticipating it when I feel a tickle on my left foot. Mind you, I'm laying flat on my back with my feet towards the hallway and my head propped up on a pillow so I could see just over my feet. I could see into the hallway, but I can't move anything. My foot's tickling so bad that it just reflexively jerks even though I can't move it myself. And as my foot moves, I could see the thing's finger reaching up from behind the couch. But the dream doesn't end this time, and I'm just laying there motionless, hearing this thing giggling from the end of the couch. I'm trying so hard to scream and wake up, but I'm stuck. When this long, dark, giggling figure starts crocodile walking up my body until its hands and feet are up near my collarbone.
bones. It starts trying to tickle my ears with its hands while its feet are all the way up my chest and its toes are almost gripping my collarbones. I'm just stuck there with its full weight on my chest as it slowly stands upright, one vertebrae at a time, until this thing is standing upright on top of me, but its chin is touching its chest looking directly down at me. It was just giggling, enjoying itself motionless. This is the first time this dream felt like hours and not minutes. And when I finally woke up, I felt the physical drain that it had on me. Like I really had weight on my chest all night. This one was so different. I never wanted to sleep there again. I had to tell my dad about it because I didn't want him to think that I didn't want to spend time with him. So I muster up the courage to finally tell my dad what's been going on. I was expecting him to make a joke and give me a hard time to try to get us both to laugh about it, to make me feel better. But he was dead serious and comforting. And to be honest, I really needed that after what happened. I was feeling much better getting this off my chest until my dad said, kid, do you mind if I ask you something? I was expecting a fatherly question about how school's going or if something in my life that's going on to trigger these dreams. But he said, the thing that you've been seeing, it wasn't giggling, was it? How could he know that? I never mentioned the giggling to anyone. I start freaking out, asking him, how did he know that it giggled? And he started trying to comfort me, telling me not to worry. He was saying, it's no problem. I could stay at my mom's till the renovation's done and it will not hurt his feelings. Then he followed up by telling me that the weekend that I was sick, he had a horrible dream where there was a figure standing in the corner of his room, giggling relentlessly, asking why I hadn't come to visit that weekend. I hated hearing that. I hated everything about what I just heard. I thought that the dreams were bothering me, but I still had a deep comfort knowing that, that they were just dreams. My dad was trying to comfort me, but all he did was legitimize what was happening to me. That whatever that thing was, was extremely real and that it was honed in on me. I made my dad take me home right away and promised that he would stay at a hotel the last week of the renovation. He agreed because I don't think he felt comfortable at that house anymore. I cannot express to you the relief that I had that night knowing that I didn't have to go back to the bizarre nun house. I acted like a big baby that night. I asked my mom if we could order in our favorite Thai food and have a comedy movie night. She obliged. She was happy to do that with me and I ended up falling asleep on the living room couch. I was as happy and comfy that I could be. In the middle of the night, I heard my phone pinging, so I just opened my eyes to slightly peek at it. I could see the screen because I left my phone face up on the coffee table and the notifications were our ring doorbells going off. They kept coming up, motion at front door, motion at back door, motion at the garage. I go to reach for my phone to check the cameras, but I can't move. I'm frozen again, but my eyes can move. The phone pinged motion at the side gate and the side gate is directly in front of me so my eyes dart to the side window all i see is a figure skipping by in a faint giggling as it passes then the phone pings motion at back door i can't look that way because my back's to it and i'm frozen i hear our back door open the alarm system goes off and says disarm alarm and it starts counting down from 30 and then i start to hear the giggling getting closer until i could see it at the corner of my eye by my feet right as it touches my foot again the house alarm starts blaring and i hear this thing scurry out the back door knocking things over as it goes. My mom comes storming into the room. The door slams shut and I get movement in my body back and I'm able to sit up. The dream happened again, but every other time I'd wake up and my setting would be different. This time I just sat up. All the ring notifications were still on my phone and my mom was yelling who's in the house and that she heard them run away and slam the door. So I'm just sitting there in our living room trying to process what just happened. My mom is freaking out while she's simultaneously asking me questions while she's on the phone with the police. I'm trying to juggle what just happened in my mind. I'm half trying to shake myself awake because I'm not sure if this is still a dream and half telling myself that somebody actually broke in and I was just half asleep. So I associated the thief with the sleep paralysis demon. I finally came to terms that it wasn't a dream. Once the police started showing up and asking questions, I really came to terms with it when we started reviewing the ring camera footage because somebody was 100% here. The figure was captured circling the house for like 20 minutes before breaking into the back door. You couldn't make out too much from the footage, but you could absolutely assume that this was just a large man. But why did I hear that same giggling? And why would a thief walk up to me and touch my foot then run away? That just doesn't make sense. He didn't even take anything. The worst part was that I couldn't tell anybody. If I said what I truly thought it was, everybody would just think I'm crazy, including my mom. I never even mentioned the dreams to her because I was borderline ashamed that I was even having them. Once the police officers left and my mom finally fell back to sleep, I just stayed awake, just relentlessly checking the ring cameras until the sun came up. I felt so paranoid at this point. With the mixture of the break-in, my dad telling me that he talked to the same thing that was harassing me and the lack of sleep made me feel like everybody was out to get me. By the time I had to go to school the next day, I felt like a shell of myself. I was overtired and suspicious of everybody around me. I was on complete defense mode. I felt like a rabid dog surrounded by water. I happened to go to school in the city, so I had to take the train in every single morning. Everybody knows the feeling of early morning commute on public transit. Everybody is in their own world. Nobody's 
chatting or making eye contact. Everybody's just listening to headphones or reading a book. The only interaction you might get is a homeless man asking you for a donation. But when I got on this train car, it felt like everybody was in on it against me. Like they were all pretending to be uninterested so I would finally let my guard down. So I sat all the way in the back with my back against the wall so I could see everybody in this train car. I spent this entire ride inspecting each and every stranger to see if they would show any signs that they were there to harm me. But nobody was showing any signs of it. The train's ticket collector came into the cart close to the end of the ride because we were in the last train car. I'd seen and spoken to this man many times and he's always super positive and friendly. Even though I was super paranoid, I was going to do my best to not be overly rude to him because this guy doesn't deserve that. When he finally got to me, I do my best to be polite and give him a kind greeting. But he must have seen how drained I was. He just asked me, you okay, man? While he was approving my ticket. And I just brushed it off with the, I'm hanging in there, you good? I was kind of avoiding eye contact because I didn't want to extend the conversation. But I noticed that he took like three seconds to start responding to me. He waited until I looked up at him to say, you look like you're afraid to sleep. He said it in a tone that sounded like he was choking down a laugh and a light smirk on his face that seemed like he was trolling me. I didn't like that one bit in this moment, but he was usually very playful and jokey with me. So I just grabbed my ticket back from him and fake laughed. Then he just jokingly said, it's time for my break and went into the bathroom. The bathroom was a couple feet in front of me to my left and he just slid the door closed. For the next 10 minutes, I just went back to people watching. As we were closing in on the station, my paranoia just started ramping up. Everybody on the train was minding their business, but I just couldn't shake the feeling that somebody was watching me. It was becoming unbearable as we pulled up to the station. I waited for everybody else to gather their things and get off the train before I even got up. Once they did, I stood up and I was looking out the windows to the right to make sure nobody was lingering on the platform waiting for me or acting funny now that they thought they were out of my line of sight. I thought for sure that somebody on the train was going to be looking back at me because I could feel somebody's eyes on me. I was passing the second window when I swiveled my head to the left and the sliding door to the bathroom was about four inches open. And as I walked past it, I saw the eyes that I felt staring at me. The ticket collector was squatted down in the bathroom, staring at me through the four inch slot. His face was shadowed, but I could tell that he was smiling. And when he saw that I saw him, it's like that he got so excited. When I reacted to his jump scare, I could see the elation in his face. It's like the joy was bubbling bubbling out of him. I was too stunned to speak, so I just stood there frozen, and I just watched his joy boil over into like devious giggles. It was that exact same giggle. And right when it started, he slammed that sliding door closed and locked it. It sounded like he was hopping around and celebrating and laughing in there. I just stood there for like three more seconds before rushing off the train. I damn near sprinted off the platform and out of the station. And once I was finally out of the station, I stopped to look around. The city was buzzing as usual. There were people everywhere, but I just felt completely alone and isolated. Why of all days would that tick collector decide to do that to me? It was just too convenient for it to be a coincidence. The mannerisms that he was doing were too similar for it to not be connected. The weirdest part about it was that once I was outside in the sunlight, out of the dark subway tunnels, it almost felt like that that couldn't have been real, even to me. It's 8 a.m. in the morning on a sunny day in a busy city. Things like that don't happen, but my paranoia is at an all-time high now. My head's on a swivel while I'm basically on autopilot walking to the school. I get there as my first period class is starting, so I have no time to process my thoughts. I just get thrusted into an environment that feels so unnatural to be in in my current state. It was an English class and the teacher was just pacing the room doing a lecture. I could not tell you what it was about. Part of me felt safe here because I knew everybody, so it gave me the opportunity to finally really think over what just happened and the possibility of it actually being a coincidence because that ticket collector is always playful with me and everybody else. He had never gone so far as to prank me, but we've always shared some good laughs in the, in the past. So maybe he was just trying to make me feel better because he noticed something was off with me. Like he had even said something about it, but I didn't really like the way that he joked with me. His tone was like he knew I was afraid to sleep and he was rubbing it in my face. I don't know. It just seemed like he was laughing at my expense. The real question was, did that really happen? Did he really jump scare me like like that? Am I overtired and seeing things? Am I just shaken up from last night and overreacting? At this point, my mind is so underslept that I feel like I'm getting the spins. I'm struggling keeping my eyes open in this class when the teacher stops walking in front of the class. Apparently, he asked me a question about what he was talking about because I noticed the class went quiet and then I heard him repeating my name. I flinched so hard when I finally opened my eyes because I noticed that the, everybody in class was staring at me, including the teacher. For a second, I swear I thought they were going to all start giggling in unison. My paranoia was back on 1000. The teacher teacher just made it worse because he was one of those teachers that would just stew in an awkward silence while just putting you on the spot for minutes at a time without repeating the question to you or letting anybody help. I could tell that he was in the mood to make an example out of me and really stretch this one out. Out of desperation, I just asked him if he could repeat the question. He kindly repeated the super vague question that I would only know if I had been listening to the lecture that he was giving. So I just said, 
I apologize for not listening. I'm sorry I was sleeping. I was hoping that the apology mixed with me taking accountability would get him to move on. Everybody in class was already looking at me, but I started to get that extra panicky feeling again. I just felt eyes on me. So I start looking around. Nobody in class was coming to my rescue because this teacher would just turn on them too. So I was just all alone. This power tripping teacher has no idea that he's launching me into an all out anxiety attack with this awful scenario that he's creating. My eyes are just darting around and the teacher breaks his silence by saying, don't worry, it'll be over in five minutes. I get a rush of cold sweat when I hear him say that. My initial reaction is to connect what he just said to the nightmares that I've been having. Was he trolling me too? How could he know? So I whip my head back to look at him, to examine his face to see if he's acting off, and I lock eyes with what I felt staring at me. The teacher was standing in between my seat and the door. The door was wooden with a square glass window taking up the top half, and right over the teacher's shoulder, I see some girl peeking in through that window. Only her eyes, her nose, and a little bit of her upper lip are peeking out the bottom right corner of the window. She's staring directly at me like she's waiting for me to notice her. I can't see her mouth, but I could see the joy in her face when she sees that I noticed her. It felt like my stomach dropped out of my body. She did a little spirit finger celebration on her own face. Then she just stayed there staring in, shaking in excitement. I could barely breathe at this point. I feel like I'm on the Truman Show and everybody's in on it, but me. I couldn't take my eyes off this girl in the window and I feel my eyes starting to well up. The entire class is still waiting for me to answer this question because of this piece of shit teacher. While my world is falling apart around me, I don't even know if the girl at the window is real at this point. And if I say any words, I'm going to break down crying. So I just look back at the teacher and point over his shoulder to see if he'll turn around and see her. And like clockwork, the second I point at her, her eyes light up and she ducks out of sight. So the teacher looks back at me from the empty window, completely fed up. Because in his head, I was making a, I made you look joke in the middle of him making an example out of me. And without Without hesitation, he says, okay, I think it's time for you to leave my classroom. Go ahead and take yourself to the dean's office. There was no way I was going out into the hallway alone. I would so much rather stay in here humiliated than be out in that hallway alone with whatever that thing is. So I just stay sitting there because I was way too worked up and scared to communicate anything to this teacher. And I guess he was taking my hesitation as an act of defiance because he started shouting at me to get up and leave. I just sat there and took it until he called the school security to the room. I wanted to go to the dean's because I wanted to go tell an authority figure in person private that I needed help, but I just couldn't get myself to go into that hallway alone. When the security guards arrived, I got up immediately because I had no intention of picking a physical altercation with these guys because our security guards were off duty cops getting overtime. They were rough dudes and would happily manhandle me. Plus I wanted them to walk me to the deeds. I was honestly so happy they were here to get me out of this humiliating situation. At this point, I couldn't care less about this teacher trying to make an example out of me. So I just completely ignored his existence as I walked out of the classroom. In hindsight, he deserved to be ignored more often. This guy would drink coca-cola at 8 a.m every morning that alone is enough for me to never listen to somebody i hate that guy to this day you miserable slob anyway i'm moving on the guards guided me into the hallway and i half expected to see this girl crawling on the ceiling but the hallway was completely empty i found a little bit of relief finally being out of that classroom and having these two cops with me but at this point i really just wanted to go home it was a really bad idea for me to try to come to school after what happened the night before my plan was to tell the dean about the break-in that happened the night before to explain to the dean my behavior and i just wanted to ask him to call my mom to bring me home. When we got to the dean's office, there was a couple people sitting in the lobby in the in-school suspension seats. It was two boys and one girl with her hood up. When we got to the dean's door and the security guard knocked on it, the girl looked up at me. It was her. It was the same girl peeking at me through the window, but there was something so different about her. When she looked at me, she seemed extremely uninterested. Like she had no idea who I was and she had zero interest in why I was in the room. She wasn't excited or energetic or anything like before. Her demeanor was the polar opposite of what it was when she was at the window. She looked back down in a way that I couldn't even really believe that she did what I thought she did. Part of me wanted to confront her and ask her why she was peeking at me, but I got pushed into the dean's office before I had the chance. Our dean was an extremely stoic guy. He was absolute no nonsense and ran his room like the military. There was no playfulness or joy in the air when he was around. It's not that he was cruel or anything. He just had a way about him that demanded order and respect. So I just greeted him respectfully and I sat down right in front of him. I was just about to start explaining myself to him when his phone rang. He sternly asked me to excuse him for five minutes. He stood up and in his forever serious tone just said, don't move till I get back. I just nodded my head and looked down into my lap. I heard the door close behind me and I finally had a moment to myself. I knew that if I was honest and apologetic, he would let me go home with zero consequences. It was such a relief to be out of that classroom and at this point, I was exhausted. I was so ready to sleep when I got back to the house, even if it meant having nightmares, anything to make this day end. I was so caught up in my own thoughts that I didn't even realize how long the dean had been gone. I looked at the clock on his desk and he must have been gone for at least 15 minutes at this point. I started to get a little uneasy because I knew that that girl was 
right in the other room. And that feeling of being watched starts creeping back in. I just know that if I look at the window on the door, she's going to be behind me doing it again. So I just take a deep breath and I whip my head around ready for a confrontation. But the window was empty and she wasn't there. But for some reason, it just made me feel even worse. I almost wanted it to be her so I could just chalk it up to this girl being a weirdo, but she wasn't there. So I look back at the desk and the feeling just keeps building. I do not like just sitting in the middle of this room at this point. I felt like I needed to get to a corner to see all of my surroundings. I look back at the clock again and the dean has been gone for at least 20 minutes. I needed to get help or get to a corner, so I just stood up and started walking to the door. But in the corner of my eye, I noticed something in the opposite side of the room. The dean had a big fake plant in his room. The plant was behind me and to my left from where I was sitting previously. So I hadn't looked in that direction when I swiveled my head towards the door. I couldn't tell what I was looking at at first, but then it clicked. It was the dean hiding behind his fake plant, staring at me with the biggest smile on his face. He had never left the room. I had been sitting in this room with a grown man hiding behind a fern peeking at me for the last 20 minutes. Hey guys, it's Storyboy here, and let me hit you with a real life situation. I've been using this tool for over five years when I realized that I was bleeding money on a monthly basis without even realizing it. It's the subscriptions, you know? It's those sneaky little expenses that add up over time. And before we dive into how I fix that issue, a big shout out to today's sponsor, Rocket Money. Thank you for making this video possible. Now let me spill the beans about how Rocket Money helped save my budget. Rocket Money is the app you need to save more and manage your money better. Now let me share my Rocket Money journey with you because it's been a long one. Canceling subscriptions with Rocket Money is an absolute breeze. No more hours wasted on boring customer service calls. Rocket Money identifies recurring charges, cancels unwanted subscriptions, and has saved me an average of $720 a year. Take a look at this, the Rocket Money app in action. Safely and securely cancel subscriptions, negotiate bills with a photo upload, set custom budgets, and automate savings. It's like having a financial wizard in your pocket. Are you ready to take control of your finances? Head to rocketmoney.com slash Dougie and sign up for a free trial. Trust me guys, it is a game changer. The link is in the description, so do not miss out. What are you waiting for? Rocket Money is your shortcut to financial freedom. Click the link, try it out, and let's kick those financial goals together. Stay savvy, my friends. I could barely believe what I'm looking at. I've never seen this Dean smile, let alone be playful. But here I am watching this massive bearded man peeking at me from behind this plant. He's almost shaking with excitement at the thought of me catching him. And he seems so delighted to just stay in this moment with me. Like he's soaking in my fear and panic for his own enjoyment. The look on his face is so bizarre that I feel like at any second he's going to charge and attack me. Just to get a little bit more fear out of me. I feel my fight or flight kicking in and right when I'm about to make a move towards the door to try to escape I hear the door open behind me. I swing my head to tell whoever just came in to run when I see the Dean walk in as serious as ever and as quickly as I looked at him I look back into the corner with the plant and the man that was in that corner is no longer there. I feel like the walls are gonna close in on me and at this point I'm questioning my own sanity. Am I developing some type of schizophrenia or am I just sleep deprived or worse? The Dean barely even looks at me and calmly apologizes for taking so long and he just asked me to sit down. I don't know what else to do at this point but just oblige and sit back down in my seat. He was analyzing a paper for a moment, paying zero attention to me, until he signed it and looked up. I must have had my emotions all over my face because the second that he looked at me, he started showing me serious concern. I could feel tears flowing down my face, but I'd been doing one of those silent straight face cries, where it feels like you have a knot in your throat and you could barely speak. He starts asking me about what happened in class and details about what happened with my teacher. I had no idea where to start or how much I even wanted to tell him. I didn't feel ready to confide in him about the things that I'd been seeing, or the issues with my sleep, because I honestly felt that if I was honest with anybody, I would be sent to a psych ward. So I decided to just tell him that my house was broken into the night before, and I hadn't slept since then and started profusely apologizing for being sent to his office and my behavior in class. He was actually way more kind than I expected him to be. I'd only seen him disciplining kids at school, so I had never seen him show so much empathy. He started reassuring me that I was safe here with him and I didn't have to go back to class until I was ready. He was saying that I was safe, but nowhere felt safe. Everywhere I went, something was following me and I couldn't tell anybody about it. I had no idea what I was going to do until he said he was going to call my mom to come pick me up. Out of pure instinct, I just said, no, please call my dad instead. It hit me right then that my dad knew. My dad had seen the thing that's been following me. He's the only person that I would want to be around because he'd actually understand. I begged the dean to stay in the room with me until my dad arrived, and he did just that. When my dad finally arrived, the dean walked me all the way to his car and told me that I could always come talk to him. He was actually a great guy, and his stoic front was just a front to keep the kids in line. He briefed my dad about what happened. It was actually the first time that my dad heard about the break-in as well. So he went full dad mode 
the moment we got into the car. He was just berating me with questions about the night before and if my mom was okay or if they had taken anything or touched either one of us. I had no idea how to start this conversation. So I just spit out the only thing that came to mind. I said, it's been following me. The thing from the nun's house. I've been seeing it everywhere. You're the only person that would believe me. He was expecting details about a break-in and I basically just told him that I'm being haunted. He was completely thrown off and I could see his wheels turning about what questions he was going to ask me next. I knew that he wanted more details about the real life break-in, but when I told him that the burglar was giggling too, he changed gears and was willing to hear me out. I made it clear that I was aware that the combination of incidents could have triggered me to connect these two things and I knew that I was overtired. So the people peeking at me could have definitely been hallucinations. I tried to be as self-critical as possible so he'd be willing to take it serious. Knowing that I was as skeptical as him, I broke down the whole day to him with the ticket collector, the girl at the window, and then the dean. Obviously, he was extremely concerned for my mental health, but I had to tell him. I needed somebody to know and it felt like a ton of bricks being lifted off my shoulders finally telling somebody everything. My dad's a game plan. He finds comfort in finding solutions. So he immediately started laying out a strategy. I don't know if he really believed me or he was just going along with what he thought would make me feel heard and protected. He completely bought into the idea that we needed to find the origin of what was following me and cut all ties between myself and it. But he demanded that I get some rest first. My initial reaction was to reject sleep, but he promised that he would sit right next to me the entire time and make sure that nothing could get to me. So he took me back to the new Airbnb that he was staying at. And just by the look of the place, I knew that he took what I said seriously. This place was the polar opposite of the nun's house. It was an apartment with big glass windows with plenty of natural light, with bright colored walls and nice hardwood floors. Just the look of the place gave me a bit of extra comfort. The game plan was that I sleep for at least three hours. Then in the afternoon, we're gonna meet with the person that rented the Airbnb to us and get to the bottom of what's been going on. When I tell you the second my head hit the pillow, I was out like a light. And it was the first time that I felt safe in days and my dreams reflected that. I didn't have any sleep paralysis, but the dreams were vivid. It was like I was watching bird's eye view of a kid running. He was running away from nuns, but he was laughing and playing hide and seek. It was pretty on the nose with how I had been feeling, just running away from nuns. When I woke up, I definitely felt better, and my dad was right there waiting for me like he said he would be. I felt better, but I also felt angry. I was ready to confront the owner of this house and demand answers. Once I had some good sleep in me, I didn't want to feel like the victim anymore. I wanted to attack this issue, and with my dad with me, I wasn't scared anymore. And I could tell my dad felt the same way. He was in full protector mode, and he texted the Airbnb owner and told him that there was a major flood in the house, and that he had to come right away. My dad had never asked for a refund, so they assumed that he had still been staying there, and that this was a real issue, so they headed over straight away. We beat them to the nun house, and we were waiting on the porch for them to arrive. I was so ready to start interrogating this guy. I was looking into every car driving by, waiting for somebody to park and walk up to us, but nobody did. I was starting to feel impatient when I heard the side gate swing open and a man walked around to the stoop where we were sitting. There was something a little bit odd about him. He was a grown man, but he kind of dressed like a teenager. Not baggy pants or a snapback hat, but like a 12 year old that still wore some of the shirts that fit him from when he was younger. He had on a Digimon graphic tee that was a little bit too small for him and red and black flannel pajama pants with white socks and Nike slides. There was no way that this guy owned property. He looked like a man child and had the demeanor of one too. He seemed quirky and innocent. He didn't say hello or introduce himself. He just said, I don't see a flood in there as if he had already checked. But when did he get here and when did he park? My dad Dad obviously had the same question in his head because he immediately asked him where he parked because this house didn't have a garage or alley. Behind the backyard was an old folks apartment complex's parking lot. And the guy replied, oh, I don't drive. I just jumped the fence in the back. I used to live here, so I took the shortcut. He went on by saying that he lives with his mom in the apartment complexes behind the house and that he just walked over. But for a grown man to choose to jump the fence and describe it as a shortcut just added to his odd innocence. My dad was skeptical of him for sure, but he was as determined as me to get answers. So he just asked follow-up questions to keep this guy talking. What was extra weird was that this guy didn't even seem skeptical about there not being a flood or why we would report that there was. He was just absolutely unbothered by the entire situation and seemed so willing to just talk. It seemed like my dad was just trying to get him to keep talking about himself to get as much information as possible out of him. All it took was my dad saying, tell me about your time living here to get him to go off about his entire life story. Apparently his mother was one of the 10 nuns that lived here. Yeah, my initial reaction was the same. Nuns aren't supposed to have kids, but apparently his mom had a moment of weakness and conceived him while they were living here. As you could imagine, this was an issue, and they had told his mother that she needed to keep the pregnancy a secret, and the baby a secret until he was old enough to understand that he couldn't tell anybody in the community about who he was. So this guy grew up in a house of only nuns, and was basically hidden from the world until his 12th birthday, when they felt that he understood that he had to go along with the lie, that he was a foster child taken in by nuns, because his real parents abandoned him. So this 
guy grew up with no interaction with the outside world or other children until he was old enough to lie. My dad asked follow-up questions that would guide him to tell us about what it's like to live in a house like that for so long and how he would keep himself entertained. And he would go on to explain that as long as he behaved, everybody was really nice to him other than Mother Superior, who treated this guy like he shouldn't exist and punished him every chance that she got. But as long as he avoided her, he loved it there. He rambled on for a bit about his love for Digimon and Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! until he finally said something that had relevance to why we were here. He said when Mother Superior would take my games away, me and Giggles would play peekaboo. Internally, I wanted to start interrogating him. I needed to hear everything about his friend Giggles, but my dad put his hand on my forearm to signal to me that he had heard that too and that he had a plan. So he followed up by saying, oh, you know Giggles too. He lives in the house with you, right? His eyes lit up like we had a mutual friend and said, oh, you know Giggles? He's my best friend. He didn't even give us a chance to butt in before he started going off about all of the fun memories that he had had with Giggles where he'd hide into corners and jump out and scare nuns and run away laughing. He talked about him like he was the best friend in the world and I honestly started to feel bad for him. But at the same time, he started to feel more dangerous to me because he's talking about the thing that has been harassing me. Like this thing was his best friend and he would defend it if it came down to it. But my dad was way ahead of me. He really gently told this guy that Giggles had been playing similar tricks on me, but that I didn't like playing games like that. He said it in a tone that wasn't accusatory or angry, just in a way that this man-child would know that I didn't really like the games that Giggle was playing on me. And just as I assumed, he immediately started defending Giggles and saying that he's harmless, and that he just wants to have fun, and that if I didn't want to play with him, that I could just leave the house, because apparently Giggles is not allowed to leave. And my dad made the right move again by replying, Giggles followed him to school today and got him in trouble. Is there any way that you could tell Giggles to not do that anymore? And like a little kid that thinks he knows a super important secret, he whispered, well, if you don't want Giggles to follow you, you just have to make sure that he doesn't have any of your clothes. This didn't make any sense to me at first. What do my clothes have to do with anything? And how would he have anything of mine? I don't remember leaving anything at this house. I barely brought anything to this house. But my dad had an agenda and asked if he knew where Giggles might be hiding my clothes and if he could help us get them back so Giggles doesn't follow us anymore. He seemed delighted to help and just waved at us to follow him inside. The entire way in and up the stairs, he kept defending Giggles, saying that he's really nice if you get to know him and that he's really funny and that he's been his best friend since they were kids. Going back into that house got my heart beating fast. I was ready to walk upstairs and see Giggles lurking in the hallway or hiding in the corner of every room, but there was nothing. I could tell my dad flipped the switch and was in defense mode because now we were in the house alone with this man child. And I could tell that he did not trust him one bit. He was just playing nice for more information. This guy brought us down the long hallway into the kitchen, right into the corner where I had felt that Giggles was initially hiding. And he just pointed at a big vent in the kitchen. This vent was much bigger than your usual vent. It was about two feet by two feet and three feet up the wall. Until he pointed it out, I didn't realize how bizarre the size and placement of it was. And he just said, Giggles lives in here, so let's check. He pulled at the edges of it with his fingernails and it smoothly popped right out of the wall. It wasn't even a vent, it was like a crawl space. It wasn't massive, but it was big enough for at least two full grown men to hide in. And there was a pile of clothes with other various items, including a stack of Yu-Gi-Oh cards. And they were laid out as if two people were playing. The man child reached in and pulled out a hoodie and handed it to me. I grabbed it, but before I looked at it, I noticed that he was looking at me funny. I opened the hoodie to see the back of it and it was my freshman year football hoodie with my last name on the back. As I was processing that this was 100% my hood, he let out a little giggle and said, you must have forgotten it here. I didn't say anything. I was furious at this point, so I stuck my head into the crawl space to see if any of my other things were in here, but I couldn't find anything that was mine. I wanted to start tearing this house apart, but my dad put his hand on my shoulder and made me thank him for helping us find it. So many dots were connecting for me, but I knew that my dad knew best and I was just following his lead. And my dad really kindly asked him if Giggles was going to leave me alone now. And the man child just nodded his head and with certainty, he said, he has to. You know his secret now. But he really liked you if you ever want to come visit again. He went from oddly innocent to terrifyingly crazy within 10 minutes. My dad thanked him for his help and then he said, you guys could let yourselves out. I'm going to stay and play. This made no sense. This guy was supposed to be under the impression that my dad is still staying here for another week, but he's acting like he knows that we're leaving and that he can stay and play. My dad grabs my arm and gestures for me to leave. So we start walking out. But right before we go down the stairs, I look back down the hallway towards the kitchen and I see this man child crawl into the vent feet first and close the vent behind him as if he's done it a thousand times. After that day, I never had a nightmare like that again or saw giggles or saw that man child anywhere ever again. My dad and I never really spoke about it again either, but I know for sure that the hoodie that was returned to me was hanging on a chair in my kitchen the night of the break-in. Hey guys, I really hope you enjoyed this story of the giggler. That is the final part of it. 
If you enjoyed this story and you want to hear more, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell. And if you really enjoyed the story, smash the like button and maybe send this to a friend. See you soon.